Good morning and good afternoon uh, to everyone. Thank you for joining Conviva's Expert in Streaming series. Today's focus will be leading with data, scaling streaming operations to drive growth with Mark Bueno from Peacock. My name is Teresa Bowie and I'll be your host. Before we begin this morning, just a couple of housekeeping notes. We encourage you to ask questions via the Q&A or chat option in your Zoom menu. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can live today. Post-webinar, we'll share the recording with you. Feel free to share it with your colleagues. Mark will be talking about best practices in launching, scaling, and supporting new streaming services. If you are interested in learning about the top five mistakes uh, Conviva has seen uh, in scaling your service, please feel free to email us at askconviva, ask at conviva.com to schedule time to talk with some of our seasoned customer success teams. For those of you who are new to Conviva, we are the only streaming analytics platform for big data that collects standardizes and puts trillions of streaming data points in context and in real time. Conviva has reinvented the fundamentals of big data analytics with a platform that is purpose-built to put complex, always in motion data to use for you in real time. With our time state analytics platform, any company can detect, can diagnose and resolve issues on live data with zero latency, making it easy to understand and act on real world experiences that your viewers have. Customers worldwide, including Sling, Fox, Paramount, NBC Universal, Sky, DAZN, and Channel 4, rely on our technology to empower billions of dollars in streaming revenues, business critical decisions, and experiences that users love. This morning, we're going to be joined uh, by our friends at NBC Universal, one of the world's leading media and entertainment uh, companies. And if there is one company in the market that knows how to support the market's biggest launches and live events, it's our friends at NBCU. With that said, let me introduce Varun Dixon, VP of Customer Success at Conviva, who will be talking to Mark Bueno, Executive Director of Global Operations and Technology at Peacock. Mark is the leader of large-scale creative and technical projects with Peacock, NBC Sports, NBC News, and Sky Showtime. He's led a 50 plus cross-functional staff through the launch of Peacock and its continued operation using data and analytics to help drive operational decisions for Peacock. He currently leads the operational strategy team focused on international expansion, efficiencies in operational tooling and workforce management. Mark has been honored with five Emmys in event coverage and sports programming for contributions during multiple Olympics. And with that said, good morning, Varun. Good morning, Mark. Varun, let's be good sure morning, to ask Varun. Mark what it's like to win an Emmy and let's see if he thanked his mom when he did. Uh, so it, it um... I remember when I started at NBC, uh, when you're part of a, a company like NBC, you get the opportunity to be a part of these just giant projects and, and Olympics being maybe the biggest one of them. Um, it is incredible. Uh, uh, there we, We're we honored to have some great leaders that go up and, and give our uh, thank you speeches. Um, so, But I will say my first Emmy I won, I think in 2012, I did give to my parents and it's in their dining room right now as a thank you for helping me through college. So the first Emmy is still at their house. Wow, incredible, Mark. Again, um, you know, congratulations on all the success you have seen there and, and many more to come your way. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, thank you for introducing us. Uh, Mark, uh, first things first, I'm a avid uh, consumer of content on Peacock app. We are a family of the binge watches Yellowstone and some of the archive content like Everybody Love Raymond and King of Queens. So I want to compare notes. What, what do you uh, enjoy the most on the Peacock app? 
Um, so we are pretty similar. My wife is a huge Everybody Loves Raymond and a, and a King of Queens fan. We, we do like watching The Office. Just, you know, that comfort content from 10, 20 years ago that, you know, it's just easy to put on in the background. We do watch a lot of that at night after we put the kids to bed. Um, Speaking of the kids, we're really excited for the Super Mario, uh, the new Super Mario movie um, to, to reach the platform over the next month, I think. So that's one we will be tuning into. And I am a Penn State graduate, uh, and I am really excited for Big Ten football to, to reach the platform this year. I think our first exclusive game is Penn State versus Delaware in September. So really excited to, uh, to, to watch some Penn State games on Peacock. Well, good luck to you on the on the game there. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> it'll be an exciting one. Uh, why don't we dig in here? You know, so w- would love for for our audience to hear about yourself. You know, your role and and the team that you manage. Sure. So, a little background about myself. Um, uh, like I said, I, I went to Penn State. I went to Penn State as a as a film major. Uh, my goal was to be uh, always working in video, but more on the creative side. And I got the opportunity to intern for NBC uh, back in uh, 2009 in preparation for the Vancouver Olympics. So uh, this upcoming Paris Olympics will uh, in 2024 will be my eighth Olympics with NBC. I've been with NBC my entire career from intern to where I am today. So um, it's it's been really it's been really um, just a great honor to be with a company like NBC so long. So uh, after my internship. Uh, and I graduated, I took an opportunity with NBC Sports Digital Production, things like cutting highlights, studio camera work, uh, editing content. Uh, But at that time in 2010, we were already streaming uh, Sunday Night Football and a handful of other events on desktop only. Um, And if you go back, and and back then, technology teams were much smaller than they were now. We were just breaking into streaming at that point. So we were trying to split the work of technology and production. And if you look at his uh, traditional broadcast companies, uh, ad insertion falls more on the production team. So dynamic ad insertion was part of our team back then. Uh, So we were inserting ads, again, desktop only for Sunday Night Football, uh, Ryder Cup, and some other events, maybe 40 a year. Uh, and then I believe it was 2011, 2012, the TV Everywhere initiative took off, and that's where the content exploded. We went from 40 events a year to probably 5,000 over that, that first year, 18 months. Um, and my, my position changed rather quickly, um, and I, be, I, I began to lead and manage the programming of digital content for NBC Sports. So bringing in different brands of golf channel, regional sports networks, digital exclusive content, NBC Sports Network at the time, bringing that into a a holistic chronological order um, uh, programming document. And then the specifications, right? Does it require ad insertion, uh, a logo bug, closed captioning? Where where are these events coming from? So while I was managing that, we also had to scale this dynamic ad insertion team um, around us then. And then we did this for a few years, 2018. I did finally move to it, the technology team under NBC Sports, and I brought that dynamic ad insertion team along with me. So now we have live event operations and dynamic ad insertion all in one team. And I think I was with the team for a few months and they announced the, 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 the Peacock initiative. So uh, in 2019, we spent uh, planning, building out a network operations center, restructuring a team, and getting ready for that launch in 2020. Uh, we, we were selected to be the operations team for Peacock because we had handled all of those major NBC events for all those years, not only sports, but, but elections and other events. We, we were the, the live stream digital operations team for those. Oh, um, yeah, so it, it was been good. I did that for a few years. Uh, and now I'm, I'm in a role where I get to take some of those best practices um, and scale that out for different joint ventures, different international expansions that we're going into, look at some of our tooling, uh, making sure that our tooling stays consistent and it's, and it's user friendly, uh, and, and then also working uh, a little bit with workforce management, making sure all of our operation centers, we're, we're um, streamlined and, and we're efficient across uh, those international centers. Oh, wow, that's great. What a what a journey it's been. And I'm guessing the six out of eight Olympics and TV everywhere was a practice run to to get ready for this this peacock launch, right? The all the the hard work and the learnings that you have had um over the years. Uh, so you know, just just digging in a little bit more, 
in the past year alone, you know, you guys have gone through significant expansion, supported like major tentpole events, FIFA World Cup. Uh, looking back, you know, 12 months, what what are you most proud of? Uh, you know, what's been the, the highlight there? Yeah, I, I, I hope it's not a cop-out answer, but I, I, I am most proud that we're able to do all of this simultaneously and together, right? So I think if we go back 18 months to January or February of 2022, we supported the Beijing Olympics, which we streamed every event live on both NBC Sports, NBC Olympics platform. And in the middle of the Olympics, we streamed the Super Bowl, which was the biggest uh, live stream event on, on Peacock. Um, so, and then shortly after that, we got ready for Sky Showtime, which we launched in 22 territories across Europe uh, and, and scaled different op uh, to new operation centers in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and, and Pune, India. Uh, and then during that, we also supported, like you mentioned, the FIFA World Cup, uh, which got a tremendous Spanish, uh, Spanish language audience uh, as we partnered with the Telemundo to stream all of those events on, on Peacock as well. Um, to be able to do that, I think we used a lot of the best practices we put in place in 2018 and 2019 as we got ready for, for Peacock. I think a lot of that um, we were able to scale quickly and efficiently. Um, for an example, the Argentina and India team uh, that we put together before the Sky Showtime launch, we trained that team within six six weeks, uh, and they were ready to go for some of the uh, first territories we launched for Sky Showtime. Um, well, that's there's a lot of change that goes into all this, too. So uh, obviously a good change management plan to, to make sure that the team is involved and they're understanding all these initiatives that we're taking on um, was important to us as well. I'm, I'm assuming there are major debriefs after each of these events and the the playbooks and the best practices have evolved from the first event you did to, to now. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's the great thing with NBC. One of the things I say to new team members when they join us for an Olympics is something I always feel is this was the most challenging Olympics we've ever done, right? Every every Olympics feels like the most challenging Olympics we've ever done, but that's a good thing, right? We, we are constantly uh, increasing you know, quality, the amount of content, the amount, the, the way we display content. So it's always stays interesting. It's always challenging. Um, but I think at our core, a lot of those processes that are processes that we've defined, we're just enhancing at this point, right? We're, we're not trying to, to recreate anything unless it requires it, of course. That's great. So, so talking about high stake launches and events, you have an exclusive live event uh, live stream of next year's NFL wildcard game. Uh, give me an insider's view of how are the preparations looking uh, for that? Yeah, so uh, luckily enough in my career, I've, I've been a part of a couple Super Bowls or a few Super Bowls. Um, and I think what's most important is don't overthink it, don't over-engineer it. Don't, don't redesign workflows just because it's a major event. Trust what got you here. I mean, the re I, I truly believe the reason NBC, um, and, and it's not just operations, but it's all the teams uh, that are a part of Peacock and direct-to-consumer and NBC Sports, the reason we have the opportunity to do the exclusive wild card game is because of the the um, the great and reliable streams that we've done for Sunday Night Football over the past 10, 12, 13 years. Um, so don't don't uh, don't blow up what, what got you here, I would say. But I think what we look at is you obviously have additional redundancy, additional disaster recovery plans. You look at all the touch points in your service chain and you and you always want to make sure that you have a backup option there, a hot failover. So if it's if you're do, going DRM encryption, you're making sure you have multiple sources you can switch between, multiple sites that you're originating content from. We're, we're obviously a multi-CDN uh, um, workflow as well. So you're looking at all of the points in the chain. You're, you're making sure that you have a, uh, an option to switch or fail over at each point of those. Is there, is there anything about this event, given that's the only place I'm going to be able to watch the game, that, that has you maybe doing a deeper inspection of you know, your process and playbooks and the, the infrastructure support that you're going to be asking of your partners? Sure. The, I think the infrastructure support is the big one, right? Like we're, we're going to hit concurrency and capacity levels that, that are going to blow the Super Bowl out of water that, uh, out of the water that we just did uh, in February of 2022. So we are talking to all of our partners, making sure that they can scale to some of the projections that our programming and business teams have put forth uh, and, and scale well beyond where we're projecting as well. Um, yeah. So I, I, that, that is definitely part of our operational readiness plan. I actually... Well, 
um, yeah. jump in if you wouldn't mind, because um, there are a couple of questions that have come in related to just what we're talking about. First, uh, uh, first question uh, to Mark, congratulations on the major success with live events. This is a unique and highly demanding space where mistakes are extremely expensive. What is the differentiating factor that helps you support live events without interruption? And should things go wrong, how do you respond to minimize the impact? Great, great question. Um, and around some of our biggest events, uh, if we do the job right uh, during the event, it, it should feel like any other event. It's very calm. It, it, the, 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 it, it should be very even keel in the in the knock or the operations. Ours is the DNOC Digital Network Operations Center. I, I'm not sure if I said that already. Uh, but what we do leading up is is what, what you're not seeing during the event is the six months, eight months, a year preparation we we put forth for these events. Um, we do tabletop exercises. So similar to an actor before they're getting ready to um, shoot a scene, we're doing a tabletop read. Uh, if a football game begins at, at six o'clock, we have every minute lined out from four o'clock of what action is taking place that minute. And the person that is taking that action is reading off of a, a piece of paper like it's a script. And we're going through that all the way to the end of the event. So by the time you're actually uh, doing the event, it should feel like second nature. So um, a lot of preparation goes in. Um, and then you hope that the event feels very quiet and very easy during the actual event. The more you sweat in peace, huh? Yes, yes, like a, <laughs> like a duck on the pond, they say. Absolutely. Well, look, we'll be we'll be partnering with you and rooting for you, and and I'm sure it's going to be the it's going to be an incredible success. Uh, you know, we talked about looking forward, but but I want you, I want to take you back maybe six to twelve months back before Peacock launch, right? And when you look look back at 2020 or maybe a part of 2019 as well, what did the planning and build out for a service like this looks like you know where do you where do you begin and how do you account for the the kind of growth that you are anticipating yeah so um i think the first thing we did we, we were the mbc sports op, uh video operations team we were very we were specialized in running single live event operations encoder turn on uh dynamic ad insertion monitoring uh uh user traffic with conviva we we had been at conviva user well before uh peacock so what we had to do is we had to take a look at all the other workflows um, that would be in P uh, Peacock. So uh, VOD, uh, linear channels, add in, SSAI ad insertion across VOD and linear channels, right? So we looked at all of those and made sure that we had the right tooling and, and some basic automation in place that we could scale and support Peacock without having to... Um, make multiple operations team. We want we wanted to, to keep a uh, centralized uh, operation team at the start of the Peacock launch. So um, because single live events were just going to be such a major uh, factor for our operations team and Peacock as a whole, we started looking at locations that we could uh, build out a, a DNOC or a digital network operations center in. We did choose Stanford, Connecticut, which is where uh, uh, NBC Sports is located. There were a couple areas that we were able to choose between, and we were, and we built out a 30-person operations center, five rows uh, with a, mo a gigantic monitoring wall at the front, which oh. is seven across, three high. Um, and, and I think... In addition to location, uh, the, the tooling was very important. So Conviva, we, like I said, we were users of Conviva. We, the team had um, skills and experience in quality of service, quality of experience monitoring at a, at a consumer level. We did have to look at VOD availability and some automation we could put in place there, manifest, manifest health um, availability, CDN availability, um, and, and we partnered with all of those tools uh, to make sure we had a, a full view of the entire platform. I think the other thing I would add is it was a young team at NBC Sports as we got moved over to Peacock. So there was some restructuring and, and additional roles that we had to put in place. Um, there's a lot of change that went into this and, and being um, being um, upfront with the team of, of why we were why we were pivoting in certain ways is, is I think we got buy-in and, and I think the team has, has been very happy to see all the growth that NBC Universal and Peacock has seen. I'm going to interrupt with a couple of questions, uh, Varun. Uh, one for Mark, and maybe Varun, you can help answer the second question. Um, 
I know you can't see our audience, so I want them to feel like uh, we're listening to them and as questions come in, we'll answer. Um, what is the action plan for high impact incidents? That's the first question. And maybe you could give us just some color, uh, Mark. And then the second question, uh, Varun, is how is Conviva data used to minimize um, the impact seen for high impact incidents? Sure. So, so the the action plan for um, was it was it major events or for major incidents during major events? Uh, the question is just what is the action plan for high impact incidents? Okay. In okay. So um, we we in the DNOC we are we are a a video operations team the team that that we are supporting um, we are monitoring and triage both uh, eyes on glass and telemetry tools. Um, we partner very closely with an incident management team under Peacock as well. So these, these high impactful incidents, we work with uh, the, the incident management team to help judge severity, uh, it, it, very some P1 through, through P3, um, and engage the, the correct fix agents and, and make sure that the, where the DNOC comes in is we want to make sure that we are giving all of the diagnostics and, and, and analysis to make the fix agents be able to resolve these high impact incidents as quick as possible. So as they are engaged, they should have all they need to be able to triage and, and, and uh, mitigate issues. That's great. Varun, maybe you can take on the second one. How is Conviva data used to minimize the impact seen for uh, these incidents and maybe give us some color? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I mean, what we are absolutely great at is taking uh, large scale data, cleaning it, processing it, normalizing it, and making it actionable in, in sub 60 seconds, right? I mean, that's what we do for a living. And that's what, you know, we have really, really perfected the technology. Now, on top of that, what we have built, it, built is ability for Mark and his team and, you know, others who are on the call who are Conviva users to be able to use our, our, our instant drill down, our instant analytics that we have built to be able to quickly get to get to those answers. Uh, so there are two ways we do it. You know, we, we rely on AI, we rely on a lot of anomaly detection that is part of our core offering to be able to surface some of these issues quickly for Mark and his team so as to reduce the mean time to repair and so as to reduce the burden on them to be monitoring everything, right? That's where our automated alerts and automated anomaly detection comes into play. And outside of that, once I know something is wrong, okay, I got the red, yellow, green, I got the alert that something is wrong, but how do I find what the issue is? And that's where our you know, instant analytics, our, our advanced drill down capabilities come in that let, you, that let you really follow the breadcrumbs, right? You are able to slice and dice the data real time using our, our platform and get to the answers quickly. I mean, you really follow the, the, the evidence, if you will, you follow the breadcrumbs and we lead you to the answers backed by our, our metrics that are being updated in real time and providing you the, uh, the correlation between experience and engagement so as to, to get to the answers quickly. That's great. Um, while I have the stage, there's uh, one more question that's come in from Mark. Mark, forecasting tentpole events is a science. How do you predict the level of support for your events ahead of time? It's a great question. Uh, we have been doing this for many years, dating back to NBC Sports as well. So um, we partner with our decision science team. We partner with our programming team. They are helping us forecast what they think uh, concurrency is. Um, and from there, we have a, a matrix of uh, leveling of events and the support we're providing for that. So um, we, we have an active production bridge. Um, and the higher the, the level of the event, the more uh, stakeholders you would want on that bridge in real time during the event. So for the NFL exclusive, for example, that will be all hands on deck from all development teams to all of our vendors um, and 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 multiple mul uh, multiple representatives from some vendors as well. So we partner with programming. Uh, the, the good thing about sports is it's cyclical a little bit. So mm -hmm. you know, the NFL season, you, you kind of know the, the, um, the support model that you had the previous season. But for things like Big Ten this year, um, where we're going to get exclusive uh, games for Big Ten for the first time, we're going. Uh, we're, we are really working with the programming and data science. What what is the what is the assumption? What is the uh, um, forecasting? And then you try to model that off of 
a previous event you did with that same type of um, uh, concurrency. I think you also have to look at the business impact to the relationship and if it's a new event. I do think for a a a the first time Big Ten exclusive is going to be on the platform. You you always want to make the best first impression you can. So you roll out a a more robust support plan uh, for your for your launch than you may uh, later on um, as you get closer to BAU. Great, Varun, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Whoever asked that question, that was uh, next on my list. So I'll, I'll yeah. skip right through it. Mark, we, you know, we've, we have seen you guys being the, the at front and center in terms of innovation and right, you know, forward looking. So the question I have for you is, what are some of the innovation or experiments that your team is, has used as a way to enhance and evolve your operations that are promising? Are there, are there any emerging technologies or things that you are, you are looking at? It's a good question, great question. Um, so I think what jumped out to me first when you were asking the question is the work that our operations team is doing in the testing and validation of 4K for uh, single live events. So over the past uh, year from uh, origination of 4K content from, from uh, control rooms and production teams all the way through transmission of those um, and uh, how we are uh, packaging and, and, and configuring them in our video CMS. Our team has worked with the development and delivery teams to make sure that we were providing requirements and, and best operational process for the team. Um, so I think when it comes to quality and increasing video quality, we, we play a, a pivotal role there because then when we are ready to launch, we're the team that's that's enabling that, but we're also yeah. having the backup there. So I think, you know, as you're expanding to 4K and and uh, um, uh, maybe 1080p, um, you always want to make sure that you, your backups are there. What, what you've done for many years, so, so having a good run book, a good process in place is, is, is what we would be contributing as well. Um, the other thing I would say is as we scale, we have a lot of tools and telemetry we're looking at across all the different video workflows. Bringing that into an aggregation model and a, a tool that an operator can sit in front of and ingest multiple different alerts from multiple different uh, providers on one page um, in a user-centered design um, kind of uh, uh, UI, both at a health view page that can be put on one of those monitoring walls that build confidence that the health of the platform looks good, but also at an individual operator level. So they can take action on multiple alerts because sometimes a, a uh, an issue with the manifest will also trigger an alert from Conviva. And what we wanna right. do is aggregate those together. So when we go give those to the fix agent, they have all of the material there. So we're starting to build tools like that as well. Mark, you uh, mentioned um, uh, uh, empowering your operators and a question has come in that is, how do you empower your operators to successfully identify and escalate issues across the platform? Yeah, um, so I let me take a quick pause there and, and think through how I wanna answer that. Um, so our operators are, are, are the first line of de defense, right? So as these alerts are coming in and the platform is being impacted, they are the first eyes on the telemetry um, and, and the escalation. So what we, all of our tools, including Conviva, we, we really go for a penalty box model, right? So in the DNOC, if you're there, everything on the board should look green. And right when something goes wrong, those red flags are flying, that should get the attention of the operators. Um, they have that working relationship with the incident management team where, hey, something is going on. I, I have to do a little bit more analysis or a little bit more um, investigation here, but an incident's coming and, and kind of starting that, starting that prep work before we fully may completely understand where the issue is, and then using all of the tour, tools at our disposal to come up with what the uh, what we are assuming the, the root cause is uh, and getting it mitigated as fast as possible. That's terrific, thanks. All right, so then Mark, building on, on our conversation here, having witnessed the growth of streaming firsthand you know, over the past decade, uh, are there any valuable lessons that you'd like to, to share with the with the audience here? Oh, um, let me think. Um, yeah, so uh, we've been streaming Sunday Night Football, again, going back to 2009, 2010. 
And I think a term that you even heard back then was cord cutting, right? And how streaming is, is the future. And I think if you asked a young Mark Bono in, in 2010, I would think that that cord cutting was coming in, in two to five years. Um, so I, I think what, what I've learned is be patient and that all of these distributions um, and technologies can live together. And I, and I think they will for a long time. And I think uh, they can be compatible. And for a business, they can be opportunistic too, to be able to um, use different distribution models to increase the amount of eyeballs that you're getting on this content, a, a wider audience. Um, so if you think of uh, pay one theatrical releases for Peacock, the box office remains a major driver post-COVID. It, it's doing very well. And, and Super Mario is a great example of that. But now, you almost get a relaunch of Super Mario when it's coming to Peacock and a new audience will be able to see it that didn't see it in theater. So I think continuing to work together um, and, and and be patient because I I don't think it's a, a flick of the switch that um, streaming is just going to uh, completely change overnight. Great insight there, great insight. Um, all right, uh, building on from there, my personal favorite here, can you talk about your journey to being an operations leader? Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> um, I was a production guy. I was a creative guy. I, I wanted to be producing content for, for my entire career. Uh, and I saw an opportunity and, and growth within streaming. And, and I took that opportunity. Um, I think what what has allowed me to be successful is I've had many great mentors at each part of my career. I've had great leaders on uh, when I was working in production, great leaders in operations and, and, and strategy as well. Um, I've tried to stay true to, to myself and the, and the characteristics of myself, but pull some key aspects of, of what they had as a leader that I thought made them a successful leader. So I've, I've pulled some of their great aspects and try to try to merge that into my own. Um, I think two things that have stuck out to me that that my grandfather said uh, when I was young was be a sponge and, and be a chameleon. Um, and, and what that means is I think a sponge is obvious, right? And, and what I would say to people that are young in their career or early in their career is you're going to be on meetings and you're going to be listening into things that you may not feel pertain to you. And, and look, I, I was a production guy and I, and I joined a technology team. I was not the subject matter expert in, in CDN or in coding, uh, and I couldn't speak to it. But on all those calls, I was listening and just trying to absorb as much as I possible. And I was never going to be the lead of, uh, of development, but I was able to build relationships with people that I knew understood that and could help me if I ever needed something like that in my career. Um, and then the chameleon is... Uh, being able to talk to different uh, stakeholders in a way that you can convey your narrative or your story differently, right? The way I would be talking to an engineering team uh, about business requirements or, or business needs would be different than the business team. And I think the, the way that you can uh, tell your story and tell your narrative to people in a way that they are going to um, comprehend it and understand it will help you in your career. Great advice. Be a sponge and be a chameleon there. I think that's a, that's a solid advice to whoever is looking to build a build a career in, in operations there. Thank you for that, that great insight. So so now now let's talk. You know, you you get to play with all the cool technology, you get to build all the um all, all the cool tools. But then looking at it from a business perspective, how do you see your role? Um you know what? What role does does the operations play in minimizing churn uh, and, and driving you know subscriber growth? Where do you see yourself uh, in that equation? Yeah, so this is something we talked to the team about uh, because as a peacock, at one of Peacock's um, uh, milestones and and, um, and 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 core um, goals is to increase subscriber go growth, and we are not the team that's going to bring. Uh, new content onto the platform, right? And, and I think the thing we always hear is content is king. Um, but what we can do is ensure that when a user or a customer is on the platform, they are getting the best experience as possible. So in doing so, that's where we are uh, attempting to reduce mean time to resolve, mean time to diagnose, mean time to identify, um, we are making sure that when a customer is on the platform, they are navigating the platform as easy and seamless as, as they um, 
it's it's almost second nature to them um and 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 it's reliable it's moving fast and and the other area i would add is i think we talked a little bit about it is we are we are helping the um engineering and development teams on increasing the quality for the platform as well so 4k content ho hoping that that brings in a new audience as, the, as they're getting to see some events uh in a way they haven't seen before so, so I'm going to double click on that a little bit there, Mark, because, you know, you'll be surprised uh, how many leaders we talk to still who are who are being perceived as cost center in their organizations, right? Mm -hmm. So if there is anyone on this call here, what advice would you give them in terms of framing the narrative or framing the the conversation with their own leadership team? Sure. No, I think that's a, I think that's a, a good question. Um, for our team, for 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 our DNOC team, we are the team that that are hands on. That they they are they are working with the programming team. They're working with the production team. They're talking to the directors to say, slate out of content, go into content, turning encoders on. We're, we're we are physically the team that's responsible for getting this content to the platform. Um, and and I think automation is a team uh, is a term we hear hear a lot about. But when you talk about production, you need that that um you need that manual ability to be able to adjust right so if if content is delayed if content is canceled postponed if there's an issue we we have the team there that is it is um controlling that content um and making sure that uh the user is getting in and uh they are able to um watch it for the entire event and and communicating back to the the production team if there's an issue Varun, I'm, I'm going to jump in with a couple of questions. Um, how does NBC leverage recommendations and AI to limit operational overhead when scheduling Peacock content? It's a good question. It, it falls a little bit outside of my purview from a recommendations perspective. Um, I can talk a little bit about the AI that we're doing on the operations side. Um, and we we have um, ingestion points with our CMS that has availability date of VOD content. And what we have is we have um, servers connected to actual consumer devices, your Roku's, your Apple TV's, your smartphones, that on an availability date, they are scripting through the UI and making sure that that, uh, that new content is playable across all those devices. So we don't need a manual um, interaction to go through because our content catalog for Peacock is growing, 60,000 assets and growing. Uh, we're also supporting Sky Showtime, which has a, a, a very large catalog. It'd be very tough to have a manual operator um, not only ensuring that it's on the platform and available, but across 14, 15, 16 different devices that we support for Peacock. So we've put uh, an AI, so that, that is really one of the, the first areas of AI that we've we've started to utilize for Peacock. Great, well, uh, another question uh, somewhat related. Uh, do you use a homegrown system to process assets programming? If not, what industry standard system do you use? Yeah. So again, um, a little bit outside of what our DNOC is responsible for. Our DNOC is think of it as the the eyes on glass and the the um, the last mile of the ensuring that things are playing from a technology perspective. We do have our custom um, video CMS that we use for both live and uh, VOD assets and editorial programming and, and merchandising. Um, that we do rely on to make sure that we uh that things are on the uh, that things that are supposed to be on the platform are on the platform and when they're supposed to go live we have the right resources in place to make sure that we're running our processes and runbook um but from a content acquisition that's a little bit outside of our operation got it i'm going to ask one last question and turn it over to varun um this is uh, this is a conviva related question so maybe to both of you this is back when you guys i i think we were talking about um incidents and incident alerts um how are threshold incident thresholds established is this discussed among different engineering teams also how do you correlate conviva alerts to your organization's severity matrix 
Great question. Uh, I'll, I'll take, I'll, I'll start Barun, and then if you want to add any color afterwards, feel free. Um, so we have been users of Conviva for a long time and, and dating back to, to before the current UI. Uh, if, if you remember the, the colorful, uh, the, the line charts and, and the, the map of the United States, that pulse view, uh, we've been use, users of Conviva since then. So we have had a lot of time to optimize our alerting strategy. Uh, and when we launched Peacock, we we relied heavily on manual alerts. And what we did is we filtered by uh, player name or device name and monitor. So I think before what I would say is before the launch of Peacock, we had goals and KPIs um, and thresholds we wanted to hit. And we set our uh, alerts, call it 25 percent above those thresholds. Um, and then we get, gave some soap time to the platform. And as we now we're starting to baseline again, we, we adjusted those thresholds from a manual perspective. We had it for, um, based on player, but we also did it by concurrency, ad impressions as well, uh, across all the different players and, and CDNs. Um, and, and, and we would audit those about every two weeks, or with, uh, we would partner with our development teams on the release cycle. So as, new platforms were making changes and they were releasing new versions, we would get to see what those new thresholds and baselines would be. And we would audit and adjust those manual thresholds. Um, we, oh, we did use AI alerts as a backstop. So we always use AI alerts as a critical level alerting that say it's a platform level issue and it's across all of your players. You would get that AI alert and it would really help an operator signify that, hey, this is bigger than just a Roku specific issue. Um, over the past six months, we are starting to pivot our approach, and we are using AI alerts as our first line of defense, info, warning, and critical, and then we're setting our manual thresholds at a much higher level as that backstop as well. In, in, uh, in operations, you always want to have uh, redundancy and, and, and different alerting uh, types, so we are still using both, but we are pivoting to the AI model um, and 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 leveraging those info warning levels. And now the manuals are more of our backstop. Yep, and I'll, I'll just add on to that, Mark. That's that's great, you know, I think that's perfect. Leveraging both the manual alerts for things that you absolutely want to surface and then relying on automation as well. Uh, I'll just add that, you know, our AI alerts are configurable as well. They have a certain level of sensitivity that we can help configure. Uh, that's where my team comes in. You know, we work with our publishers very closely and based on the SLAs and KPIs that they have set for themselves, we help them tune those alerts. And I want to sort of uh, double down on something Mark said. This is not a one and done process, right? As you are launching, uh, you know, new feature and functionality on your app, as you are playing with new content profiles, as the delivery infrastructure continues to improve, I think the bar uh, that we have to set for ourselves and the experience that we have to deliver to our viewers, you know, the bar keeps keeps getting higher and higher. And as a result of that, you know, what we monitor and what we tolerate, <laughs> that that bar, you know, that line also continues to shift. And that's where it's a consultative process. You know, we I think when we talk to, to our customers, you know, we work closely with Mark, Mark's team as well. We are able to bring that best practice and our point of view into the discussion as well. That's great. Um, Varun, I know you have a long list of questions. Um, I think we have time for one more of yours. All right, let's let's uh, let's let's uh, let's look at the last one that I have for Mark then. You know, looking ahead to 2023 and beyond, uh, let's talk about your, pro your priorities and goals in terms of operational tooling and strategy. Yeah, so I think it's to double down on, on a little bit about what we've talked about so far. Um, bring uh, bringing a aggregated model for our, all of our, our our tooling needs, so an operator can take action quickly and integrate with a um, a um, incident management and and and, and uh, ticketing system. Um, so continue to expand on that. I, I have goals in having more visibility into into the chain. Um, video delivery chain as well that could bring into an alerting strategy. So when an alert fires, it, it, it can show you where in the pipeline of a delivery of that asset, it may have failed. Um, so continue to build on that. 
Um, I, I think we had a great launch with Sky Showtime, um, be able to support the business for future joint ventures or future international expansions. I have confidence that we're going to be able to, to scale that quickly after seeing what we did with Sky Showtime. So be, you know, if, if I'm looking at the next 18 months, I'm sure we'll have another um, expansion opportunity that we'll be able to roll out these processes and tooling across. Um, and I think something we talked a little bit about is finding the right areas to use automation. I think AI and ML are, are, are very um, front and center in our industry right now. Um, I talked about it a little bit of how we're using it for uh, VOD asset monitoring. Um, I think using it in the right way that we can leverage AI to do some um, scriptable operations and leave, leave our operations team to do the white glove, the, the real, the things that you want to say for a manual touch when you're talking about Super Mario hitting the platform, right? Like you need to make sure that that thing is going perfect. You need to make sure the NFL exclusive is going perfect. So using AI and ML to help us um, to optimize our team to focus on uh, where, where uh, the business really needs them. I think that'll be important over the next year and 18 months. Well, we'll again uh, be working closely with you and supporting some of those initiatives. I look forward Absolutely. to it. Absolutely. Mark, it's been uh, it's been sort of great conversation with you today. Really appreciate you making time. I, I just want to quickly recap what I heard before handing it back to Teresa. Uh, a few things that I heard is you're, you're really excited about the Super Mario uh, yeah. Coming on the Peacock platform, so that's that's great. My kids, my kids are very excited. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys are looking forward to it. Uh, the other thing was, don't overthink it, don't over engineer it. I think the words to live by: uh, trust your process. Couldn't agree more. Just because the environment changes or the scale changes, that doesn't necessarily mean you should try and re-engineer everything. And I think something that really, you know. I could relate to is empower your operators, right? How do you enable the people on the ground, the frontline folks to be able to, with the right tooling, right data and, and capabilities and empowerment to make this decision. I think that's that's a great uh, philosophy there. And I think be patient, right? I think you said it, technology uh, and multi-platform or multi sort of uh, distribution will continue to coexist. And we got to figure out how to make it work for, for our audience, right? In both places, whether, it's on the streaming or, or non-digital platforms. And then my favorite, be a sponge, be a chameleon. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, noted, noted, noted. That's great. Look, Mark and Varun, thank you so much for uh, this lively session. Mark, I hope you're not doing anything next month because we didn't even begin to answer the inbound questions uh, for you. Uh, for our audience, thank you again for attending. We hope to see you at our next event. As a reminder, today you heard Mark talk about all the best practices. If you would like to hear about some of the top five mistakes we have seen companies make, feel free to reach out to us at ask at conviva.com. And with that, I will say goodbye and thank you very much. Bye, everybody. Thank you.